You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Hey everyone, it's Paige, your favorite nutrition podcaster and dietitian. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores what really matters in nutrition and health with a sensitive and realistic approach. This podcast relies on the support of listeners like you and needs donations to keep this project running. To help support the podcast, please consider making a donation at pagesmathersrd.com slash podcast. If you find this episode interesting, engaging, or helpful in your life, please consider donating, sharing with friends and family, and leaving a review on iTunes. You can leave a review about this podcast straight from your podcast app, search Nutrition Matters Podcast, click reviews, and then write a review. You can also find me on Instagram and Facebook at Paige Smathers RD if you'd like to have a little more food for thought. Thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast. My name is Paige Smathers, and I am your host. And today I had the lovely privilege of sitting down with Leah Kirschbaum, who's a registered dietitian in Salt Lake City. And we talked all about this idea of how to kind of occupy a gray space with intuitive eating and with health in general. Um, One thing we've observed as registered dietitians working in the kind of anti-diet space is sort of this tendency to make intuitive eating somewhat of an all or nothing pursuit. And we take some time today to explore some of the pitfalls of that and also maybe some other ideas of how to navigate through Uh, through the process of discovering sort of an alternate way of approaching your health and nutrition, whether you are a nutrition professional or you're, um, you know, a lay person who doesn't do that professionally, but someone who's trying to navigate this on a personal level for yourself as well. Uh, we, We all kind of fall into this trap here and there. And Leah and I just wanted to sit down and talk about, talk about how to kind of work through this in a way that kind of helps to promote well your your own well-being rather than kind of making you feel crazy in the process. So let's just quickly, let me just quickly introduce you to Leah. Leah Kirschbaum uh, graduated from UNLV and now lives in Salt Lake City. And she talks about this in the episode, but she took the first few years of school or after school trying to figure out which job within the field of nutrition and dietetics would fit her well, and even took a little bit of a break from pursuing nutrition-related, a nutrition-related career just because she was really feeling like she wasn't finding a space that really resonated with her and, um, and really fit with her sense of what's what's best and what feels ethical to her. So this is sort of a story we hear a lot in this in this world is, you know, you find intuitive eating and health at every size and things kind of start to click and you get re excited about the the path of being a dietitian. So she talks about that a bit in terms of her own personal journey with all of this. And um, she's she's uh, an advocate for the non diet and health in every size movements. And she really, really loves to help people bridge the gap between food and body. And that's um, that's her Instagram handle is called Body Meets Food. So Leah is just, this, this conversation with Leah was so much fun. And she's just a phenomenal person. And I really, really enjoy her. And I know you will too. So I want to be sure to keep you up to date on some events coming up on the calendar. Um, I'm teaming up with one of my favorite, favorite mindfulness teachers, And we are going to be putting on an all-day mindful eating workshop here in Salt Lake City in the spring. Now, I've mentioned this on the last few podcasts, and I'm still sort of keeping it a bit vague because we're still narrowing down venues and dates and details. Um, But I do want to encourage you to either hop on my email list or check out my website. I will, at at the point that this is being published, I will have more details there and for sure ways for you to stay in the loop and get the announcements. You're also more than welcome to um, follow me on Instagram and or Facebook to be able to hear the announcement there as well as far as a location and a date and a time so that you can plan accordingly if you'd like to be there. I'm so excited about this. This is going to be a 
you know, not a gimmicky, not a diety, not a weight lossy type seminar and workshop. This is really diving into principles of mindfulness that can help you in your relationship with food and your body. So I'm stoked about that. Keep that in mind and definitely stay in touch with me to be able to find out those details. And then as always, um, you're more than welcome to join us over on the Facebook group for the podcast, which is called Nutrition Matters Podcast Community. Um, Request to join the group and become part of the conversation and meet some other like-minded folks there who are grappling with these concepts alongside of you. And it's a lot of fun. And then if you like what you hear on the podcast and you'd like to see um, how you can maybe take things a little bit further and really dive into the details with this and the how-tos and, and some structure and some guidelines and some ideas of how to work through you know, really giving up dieting for good and finding a really healthy, well-balanced relationship with food. You're more than welcome to check out my online course to see if that might be a good fit for you. You can find more information about that at pagesmathersrd.com slash course. And let's see, is that all I want to mention? Um, as always, you know, leaving a review for the podcast is so appreciated. It just takes a few seconds. And now if you actually have the your an iPhone, you can actually do this directly in the app. Um, it's, it's easier than ever to leave a review. And I would really, really love more of those because the more reviews I get with the podcast, the, the more people find the show. So if you could just take a few minutes to give back in that way, that would be lovely as well. Um, Yeah, and so excited about this conversation that I have to share with you with Leah. And I really hope that you understand um, the spirit of what we're talking about here. It's not to point fingers. It's not to blame. It's not to um, tell anybody that they're doing anything wrong. It's just sort of broadening this conversation about how do we approach intuitive eating in a way that's functional and realistic and sustainable for us rather than kind of turning it into another kind of diety, all or nothing pursuit. So I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. And with that, let's get on and listen to the conversation with Leah. Leah, welcome to Nutrition Matters podcast. I'm so happy you're here. Paige, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. I love your podcast, and I just want you to know that I refer so many clients to your podcast because it's been so helpful. Oh, good. That's exactly, you know, why I do this work, because I really feel strongly that hearing each other's stories, hearing these conversations, being able to kind of hash things out in depth in audio format is so valuable to whether it's someone who's kind of recovering from chronic dieting or whether it's someone who's just interested in learning more about nutrition or even someone who's in the midst of eating disorder recovery, I feel very strongly that, you know, there needs to be these voices of reason and compassion in, in the midst of all the insanity around nutrition. So thanks for saying that. I really appreciate it. And I love hearing that it resonates with people. It's, it's why I do it. So, um, Leah, for those of you listening, Leah is a friend of mine who's a registered dietitian in Salt Lake City, and we are actually recording live together, which is only my second time doing this in person. Um, It's a little bit funny with the mic I have. I don't have two, so we're kind of leaning in and sharing one mic right now, which is kind of funny. I wish you could see us. (laughs) But um, so we're here recording live together, and we're so excited to chat about something that has kind of up till this point been a bit unexplored on this podcast. We're going to be, let's see if I can do it justice by trying to kind of summarize it here, Leah, but what our goal is today is we want to talk about this idea of how it feels to kind of be exposed to health at every size and intuitive eating, kind of this world of weight neutrality and gentle nutrition, um, and, and what it's like to sort of navigate what you what you leave behind and what you keep with you and how you occupy a space of sort of grayness that's right for you. Um, a lot of times it can kind of feel like you, you spend so much of your life dieting and, and pursuing weight loss, and then maybe you realize, gosh, this is not working for me. I don't ever want to go on another diet again. Maybe you come across the concepts of intuitive eating um, in that process, and it can kind of feel 
frustrating. It can make you angry. It can make you feel like really, really upset that you wasted so much of your precious time and energy on something that was actually not helping you and and in most cases making things worse for you health-wise and also mental health-wise. So a lot of people can feel really angry and sort of um, really excited, but at the same time mad about this about being lied to and excited about this new opportunity of doing things differently. Um, and then there can be some fear involved with what, what what does life look like if I'm not pursuing weight loss at every moment. And there, there can just be a lot of emotions that come along with this whole process, both as a professional and also as um, a person who's coming across it just in regular life. And so all of this is just to sort of set the stage to help you understand what Leah and I wanted to talk about was kind of how to make your own pursuit of taking really good care of yourself through maybe principles of intuitive eating, health at every size, weight neutrality, that type of thing, how to do this in a way that's right for you and to kind of avoid the tendency that we get into to kind of make this a new judgy, all or nothing black and white pursuit where sometimes you can kind of feel like okay I'm rejecting dieting therefore you know broccoli is bad because I used to eat that when I dieted Um, kind of how to occupy this gray area where you're able to kind of do do your eating and your life and approach food and your body in a way that's right for you and not this judgy endeavor where now you're you're judging your your neighbor or your friend or your um, mom who's who's still dieting um how to kind of live in our world still when many people don't know about this and or this idea doesn't resonate with them so that was a really long kind of intro leah how did i do what do you want to add that was wonderful um it's so true there's such a transition that you have to go through both as a patient and as a professional when you're being exposed to the world of intuitive eating and the anti-diet movement and health at every size And um, if you want, I can go ahead and kind of just start through and go through my story a little bit as a professional. Um, I graduated as a registered dietitian in 2013 from UNLV. Um, So hello to all my Las Vegas people. Um, And I kind of just, I was traditionally trained. Um, I had a great program. I loved everything about it. Um, I noticed, you know, when I graduated, I felt like I had to do kind of the obligatory year of clinical, and I found myself, you know, learning some things there, and and of course, this is no offense to anybody who is a clinical dietitian or still resides in that space. Obviously, um, we need a variety of dietitians in a lot of different areas, so, um, but for me, it just wasn't a fit, and I knew that I kind of wanted to branch out and find something else to do, and you know, finding your, your niche in nutrition is is kind of tricky because it's so vast. There's so many different areas that you can get into. And for me, I was trying to figure that out and I was getting a little bit frustrated and I would kind of go from, from job to job exploring different things and just wasn't really finding anything that I loved. And I was honestly getting really burnt out and I was like, I don't even know if I want to be a dietitian anymore. Like I don't, really want to be just writing meal plans and helping people with weight loss like that just it, I wasn't really connecting to that and I actually took a can break I ask can I ask yeah. like did you ever have like what did you observe when you were doing that type of job like what made you feel burnt out in that space uh what made me feel burnt out was I didn't I didn't know how to approach it right I would I would be trying to help these people that were coming to me for weight loss let's say and we would go through and we'd write out this really detailed meal plan. Um, we'd have, you know, exercise um, exercise plans and, you know, just kind of the whole gamut. And they would just come back to me and they wouldn't follow it or they couldn't do it or it wasn't sustainable. And there was this whole emotional side that I was completely missing. Did you feel like you had to be like, I always say this to my clients, like, I'm not Jillian Michaels. I'm not putting on my spandex and like whipping you (laughs) like I feel like that's almost the type of like persona you have to like occupy when you're in that space where you kind of have to be like mad at people that they didn't follow through or kind of like be really hard on people and that that doesn't really 
like you can see this the sadness and the shame and the disappointment in their eyes and you're just like what am i doing with my life like this is not fun and this isn't really helping people exactly that that's exactly how i felt and i also experienced that so much of the advice that i was giving Right. I felt like I had to subscribe to some specific way of eating. And so I would try things out. I would try different diets or different approaches to eating. And I couldn't sustain it, let alone recommend it to other people. And so... So did you feel kind of like an imposter with that? Like, okay, I'm recommending this meal plan, but I know I could never follow it. I mean, that's that's rough on your like heart and soul. Yeah, it it really is. And I just, I didn't really know... What else? Like, I didn't feel like I had a voice as a dietitian. Like, I didn't know how to really help people. And so, yeah, I felt pretty burnt out. And I took a break from nutrition for a year and had a completely unrelated job um, as a personal assistant. That was wonderful. But when I moved to Utah from Las Vegas, I, you know, was introduced to the world of intuitive eating. And I was like, yes, this is it. This is something I can get behind. This is an approach that I can take to help anybody because you can apply these principles to anybody and everybody, whether or not you have, you know, a full-blown eating disorder or you've just struggled with chronic dieting. And Not to mention, you can provide the same recommendations for someone in a larger body or someone in a socially acceptable body or someone in a very small body, right? Like it's, it's all, it's all the same with some minor changes in terms of like, you know, sometimes people have real struggles right away with honoring and recognizing hunger and fullness, for example. And so you can't always go right there with every single person. But, you know, in general, you're not sitting here with someone with a large body saying, okay, restrict this, don't eat that, make sure you're, you know, feeling hungry or whatever all throughout your day. And then a smaller person being like, oh, no, you should never be hungry, you know. So it, it on, on that level, not only does it, is it really valuable and meaningful for various health conditions, which feels really ethical as a nutrition provider, but also um, people who who show up in different bodies. You don't have to kind of like make a mental judgment of like, oh, okay, we're going to have this conversation today. It's kind of like this is the type of things I talk about with every client. Exactly. It's awesome because you can can look at the whole picture. You're not narrowing or, um, you know, cornering yourself and all your nutrition advice into one corner of, of weight loss or something. You're, you're looking at the whole person. You're looking at their relationship with food, their, their life experience with food, um, which in the end is what's going to create changes that might need to happen, right? It's, it's figuring out the person and, and how they relate to food. And you can't always fix you know, quote, food problems with food. It has to be approached from a a behavioral and a mental standpoint. Perfect. So those are some of the things that really resonated with you right away with the switch. And this sounds like you came across it when you were able to move to Utah with the work that you do here. Um, What about, like, what was tough about adopting this or what kind of, you know, what did you have to unpack or wrestle with personally in order to really feel like this was like, okay, yes, I feel good about this. This is what I'm doing, if anything. Yeah, absolutely. I did a lot of wrestling um, for the first, I would say, three or four months. Um, I really loved the approach and I really, um, it really resonated with me. But I, there was a part of me that still, I don't want to say I had one foot out the door, maybe like one pinky toe or something, because you really are challenging so many things that you've learned from school and just from growing up in a diet culture that you're like, hey, is health at every size like really a thing? Like can health at every size really be a way to look at at health and to work with your patients? And I did find myself also the pendulum kind of swung. So you come from this really traditional, you know, clinical background, um, you know, dieting, weight loss, that kind of approach. And the pendulum swings to the complete opposite. And 
when you're working in the field of eating disorders and you see, you know, someone coming in and sitting on your couch and just being in tears because of what they're going through or what they're struggling with, whether it's an eating disorder or dieting, it breaks your heart and you kind of get angry and you're angry at the world and you're angry at our diet society and you're angry at all the marketing and all the gimmicks and all of the money that goes to it, goes into it and all of the focus on body image and you just kind of get pissed off honestly and it's really easy to become angry um and so that was kind of something that I, I wrestled with where I was just like, wow, like there is so much work to be done and, and there is still a lot of work to be done, obviously. But when you first make that transition, especially for me, and I'm sure a lot of you might feel that way, that you get you get kind of angry and it's really easy to start um, feeling judgmental, I guess you could say. Yeah, I I I've seen that too and I've kind of had to wrestle with that myself as well. And one of the things, I mean, I'm sure this is way more complex than what I'm going to boil it down to here right now, but one of the things that I have sort of observed is just this general idea of when you believe that you have like a, like an insight that others don't have. And when you're, when you kind of almost feel like you've quote seen the light, it can be really difficult to remember what it felt like when maybe you were in the position where you weren't seeing the light yet or hadn't been there. Um, And so it can kind of, when you feel like you have this moral high ground for lack of a better term, it can almost, you can almost feel this need to like go out and evangelize and like try to get everybody on your side and like look for validation and like, I'm not the only person doing this, right? Like you are too. Let me tell you why you should be and kind of spinning your wheels to get lots of people on board and validating you where a lot of times you run into some really big brick walls. And I actually have a bunch of clients who talk about how, you know, time and time again, they'll say, oh, I I shared what I'm doing with my mom or my sister or my friend. And they just looked at me with like a really confused face. And I could, I just was so ashamed and I, I, I feel so alone and there's sort of this need that we want people to understand us we want people to get why we're doing what we're doing but the truth is like this is complicated stuff and this is actually part of why I do the podcast is to try to help give little tidbits of this philosophy in a format that you might be able to share with those people so you could say this is why I'm practicing weight neutrality. Share this episode about that topic with my mom who just can't seem to understand it. Um, where was I going with this, Leah? I don't know. I feel like I'm just blabbing on and on. <laughs> but this is a this is a thing where we where we really want people on our side. We want people to understand us. We want that validation. And the truth is it doesn't always come. And I think that that's, that's something we have to recognize in ourself what we're really doing and be self-aware enough to recognize like oh what I'm doing right now is seeking validation and I may or may not get that and I need to kind of like check myself a little bit and kind of recognize that I need to be secure enough in the way I'm approaching my own health and nutrition and self-care that I don't necessarily seek that at every turn because it can really suck you back into the whole dieting culture when you're looking for everybody in your life to be doing the same thing you are because that's just and and also professionally right like we you and I Leah and I need to exist in a space where we're able to rub shoulders with and communicate with and be on the same team with other healthcare professionals who maybe have a bit of a different way of approaching and we, I think one of the things I need to always remind myself is not everybody sees it this way and everybody's really just trying to do the best that they can with what they know. And it's my job to sort of be that bridge whenever the opportunity arises. Yeah, it it's interesting because, you know, it's really hard to understand if you haven't worked with this population um, – as a dietitian, like I can't expect anybody else to understand this approach or um, see why it's so helpful and is able to um, promote so much change in people because you know they haven't they haven't sat down in a room with someone who struggles with an eating disorder and um, so you know it's just not on on their top of mind because that's not the clientele that they work with and that's totally fine and 
So, I, you know, I think what, you know, the, the message of this podcast um, or, you know, kind of what we were getting at is, so once I entered this space and the pendulum kind of swung and I was feeling, you know, it's really easy to start feeling kind of judgy and saying, well, intuitive eating is the only way. And um, I, I mean, I'm a huge advocate and, but I can be an advocate without putting down others work or approach and in, in my opinion um, I think that there has to be space for everybody to to learn and I I noticed a little bit um, when I was getting kind of really caught up in it I guess you could say and I noticed that my my emotions were more like angry and aggressive than like a, holding a space for people to come and talk and just um, I don't know just being more open about it Um, you know, I would see things on social media, you know, in particular where professionals would be talking about it, um, be talking, you know, somebody would pose a question about, Hey, can I, can I want to lose weight and, and still eat intuitively? And the response was just more hostile than I wanted to see. Um, and it was, I was like, wow, like, I don't, I don't feel like this is the message of intuitive eating, right? I don't want to come off as someone who nobody can talk about dieting in front of me or I'm offended by every little thing that's going on or um and so I I really wanted to take a step back and I had a couple other experiences just within my family where they're like Leah we feel like we can't even say anything around you anymore because you know you're gonna get mad if we mention the word diet or or whatnot and I was like okay you know what like I need to tone it down a little bit and not back off on my stance because I stand 100% with intuitive eating and health at every size but I just I felt like I needed to open this space a little bit does that make sense yeah so I feel like it can be really tricky um at least in my experience so I'm a podcaster but I'm also a dietitian who does individual counseling and sometimes the way you you speak when you know that you're talking to potentially the full gamut of people has to be a bit more of a hard line than when you're talking with a person, you're holding space for where they are. That, that I think there's a distinction there. And that's not to say that I'm one way on my podcast and another in person. Don't, you know, don't misunderstand that I, that I'm like a dual personality or like living two lives or something like that. Like it's definitely, I am fully grounded in this approach and this is definitely um, how I feel is an ethical way for me to practice. But at the same time, the very last thing I would want to experience is someone with a genuine concern about dieting or about their body and them to feel like I'm unwilling to be able to like be in the presence of that sentence, for example. I mean, I'm I I don't want to come off that sensitive or that um, easily angered, where I'm not able to do my job. Because the truth is, most of the people we interact with um, in session are potentially hearing about these things for the very first time when they walk through our door. Um, luckily, a lot of my clients find my podcast ahead of time, which actually really helps. Uh, just yesterday I had a new client who said, oh, I've been listening and I totally, I'm getting this. I just have a few questions. And she booked the appointment for a very different reason than what it ended up being when she came in. So I'm always happy to have that happen. But there are definitely people who walk through my door who um, who we really have to spend the first few sh- sessions hashing some of these things out. And um, I think that that's a really important process for a lot of people. And I think it's important to provide a safe space to do that. One other thought I had, Leah, and I'm really interested to hear how you've navigated this idea of like, how do you how do you stand firm in your personal convictions and your professional convictions around these issues while also being open to hearing other people? Um, One of the ways that I do that personally is um, I really like to differentiate between ideas and identity, right? So I think ideas are always worthy of um, discussion and discourse and disagreement. Oh gosh, listen to that alliteration. I didn't even mean to do that. Um, so I think that it's it's always a worthy pursuit to to dive into these things and to really ask questions and to explore 
these concepts and you know it's okay with me if someone disagrees with me I know that we can still be um, we can still love each other or have a great relationship uh, on the levels that really matter because my ideas are not me you know like I'm me and I differentiate my own sense of identity from the beliefs and the ideas that I have and I think that I don't know how this will resonate for anybody else listening but for me that has been a really really important thing on a on a very personal level but also on a professional level to be able to say they hold that to be true for them I hold this to be true for me who cares we are still you know sisters or neighbors or friends and that's what's important so I feel really strongly that that's something that's part of this work that's part of the process not only do you get really angry when you know you're finally seeing gosh I've been wasting so much of my time and energy on stupid things that have actually been making my life worse even though I was trying to do the right thing well now you have to navigate how do I hold that belief when no hardly anybody else does you know and still exist in this world and I think for me that's been a crucial part what what would you add like what have you done to to kind of navigate that yeah, I think, I mean, going back to the, you know, original part of the question of how do I maybe help my my patients? Is that what we're talking about? Patients versus on a professional level? Like, when they, when they come into my office, um, I encourage them to come in with questions, to, to challenge me, to bring up any of, you know, the concerns that they have and bring in the book that they're reading and highlighting and something that might go against what I'm saying so that we can talk about it because if they don't, if there's not that space for that, then we're not really going to get anywhere. And I have to put my own, you know, strong beliefs or, um, you know, passion, you know, just on the sideline for a second and say, okay, you know, what are you bringing to me? How can I help you? How can we meet in the middle? Because the reality is, is people are going to approach you and they're not going to have any idea of of this approach and so you have to meet them where they're at and if they're coming to you and wanting to work on something that maybe isn't in the realm of intuitive eating it's like I'm not just going to shut them down and tell them no like we can't work together it's going to be like okay how can I help you navigate and learn more about yourself and you know what truths can I offer um, that might resonate with you so yeah for sure I love what you've been saying and one thing I would add too is There is a particular profile of a potential client that I've experienced that's just not going to jive with me, you know, like where it's like I do have to have some type of a line where it's like if they are expecting, you know, the very prescriptive diet thing from me, I'm just I'm not going to go there because of my like because truly like ethically I'm going to walk them through the lack of research to support that method. I'm going to really explain why that potentially could lead them to a very worse off state and how as like a licensed professional, I don't feel like that's ethical for me to do. And I've actually had to do that a few times in the private practice setting, which is really rough because then it's like, okay, now pay me, you know? Um, (laughs) So, you know, I think that there is a line, but I, I just the discourse I see online, sometimes I'm like, does it need to be so like black and white in terms of like, oh, I will not work with with you because you said this one word that I don't like. And, I, and that's okay if that's where a certain person is and if that's what they want to do. My only concern when, when, I, when I hear that or I see that or I imagine myself holding that, that line so, so um, all or nothing-ish, if that's a way of talking, anyway. Um, it's just that what's that person going to go do? They're probably going to go down the road to the uncredentialed whoever at their gym and get some really terrible advice. Like there's always a chance that I might, I mean, I've actually had a lot of experiences where I'm able to be a safe space, ask a lot of questions, um, help that person explore what's right for them. And not necessarily have this like preconceived, I want you to do this, this exact way. Again, I'm not very prescriptive about my nutrition recommendations, but I've seen a lot of people kind of talk themselves through this. And 
here's another point. A lot of people haven't ever sat down and talked through this stuff. They haven't ever had a safe space to explore body image, to explore nutrition and self-care and and the practice of feeding themselves. And sometimes just sitting there, holding space, asking questions, saying, well, what do you really think about that? Or is that a good, is that, where does that thought lead you? Or what do you think would happen if you approached it this way? And just asking some of those really exploratory questions in a non-judgmental way, which requires some work on your own end, because sometimes it is tough to listen to what they're saying. You're like, Glah! you're not, yeah. you know, you're not going to be led to a great space if you do that. But just sometimes I've seen people say, oh my gosh, saying it out loud makes it sound so crazy. Why have I been doing this? Maybe I need to try this. Do you have any thoughts? And then it's like, okay, here we go. You know, so I don't want anyone listening who might be a health professional or a dietitian think, oh, Paige is saying that it's so terrible if I hold the line I'm at, you know, I will not work with you if you want weight loss. I think that's okay. But I personally, um, I don't, I don't always, I don't always experience that as like being where the line needs to be for me. So, and another thing is a lot of my clients never talk to me before they book an appointment. So mm. sometimes I don't even have the opportunity to screen that. They usually self-screen based on listening to my podcast, reading my blog. I have a lot of resources um, to help people kind of get a feel for what I do and don't do as a dietitian. Mm -hmm. What would you add to that? Sorry. No, I was just thinking while you were saying that, that's the art of motivational interviewing, which I don't feel like I got a lot of, or I, I didn't really have experience with motivational interviewing before I got into this space. And now I feel like, wow, this is such a great way to counsel people and it really fits so it's well. Also, with that a great model. way to talk to your husband. Yeah, <laughs> FYI, you get um, really good at asking a lot this, of questions. Yeah, let me make this your idea. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you lots of questions so you come up with it. Yeah, I'm gonna get you to say what I want you to say. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I never do yeah. that. No, no, none never. of that. Um. So, yeah, I think, you know, coming back to why we did this podcast is the gray in intuitive eating can can be really helpful. And you mentioned earlier not creating that new black and white, right? Not making intuitive eating this new this new diet, which is exactly what we're trying to get away from. Um, but at the same time, holding a line, holding a line, being an advocate, um, you know, being vocal about what you're passionate about and but also not being, judgmental and assuming that everybody else has the same experiences that you've experienced and people have to come to their own conclusions and you can invite them you can invite them to do that and so I don't know that's kind of no that's great and it is it's so tricky and I one thing I would say to anyone listening who might be a professional or who might just be someone who's really interested in this stuff and, and applying it into your own life is don't be surprised if you take it a little too far and then pull back a little bit and then move back in the other direction and kind of wiggle back and forth where you kind of feel like, okay, yeah, I'm honing in on the intensity that I like with my beliefs around this. And, you know, sometimes sometimes it does require a bit of overcorrection where you're like, dude, I was way over in la-la land with dieting. I might need to overcorrect for a little bit and be way over here in – this intuitive eating space. Um, and I'm not advocating for like not being an intuitive eater, but I'm just saying, I think the point of like, if we zoom out on this whole thing, I think really what we're just trying to do is trying to figure out how to take good care of ourselves within our means and within our, the, the realm of our experiences and the way that our brain and our bodies work. And that is going to look a bit different for each person. And so I think there is this tendency to be like, well, she's doing, she's posting these pictures and she's eating this way, so I should be. Or I'm rejecting dieting, therefore anything I ever used to eat when I was dieting is off limits or almost like bad to eat those foods. Like there's there's this new kind of paradigm of good and bad and right and wrong and morality which is like, hello, I just want to scream on the rooftops. Like, that is not the point. That is not the point. And it's definitely something we do. We tend to kind of gravitate towards easy categorizations because it's just the way our brains work. But in the end, it's not really beneficial. So, 
Yeah. So when you said there's a gray area in intuitive eating, <laughs> and when we've kind of been using that metaphor throughout this podcast, I, I can see a few of my very respected and wonderful colleagues like cringing a little bit because I think that there is there is a degree of like, no, this is black and white. Like this is it. This is the way. And there's some, some you know, you could wor- use words like militant. I mean, some people have have used these words in describing their activism around this, which I honestly, in my heart, I feel like there's a time and a place for that. I feel like there is a need for people to be outspoken and intense in their beliefs. And they, that has that has its space. Um, but what do you see as the gray area that we're talking about here? Like, what is that? Like, we've been alluding to it, but we haven't really like, talked about what that might look like or what that might be in in practical terms yeah I think grayness and intuitive eating um it comes you know I think it's bringing it back to center right the pendulum swings really far to the left or really far to the right that's not a political statement yes no (laughs) (laughs) and uh, we decided we were leaving politics out of this beforehand so Grayness is, you know, not using terms like intuitive eating purism and true intuitive eating. And um, it's not judging other people who who don't practice intuitive eating or haven't experienced it or assuming that if they post a picture of a green smoothie or an acai bowl that they're not they're not um, completely against it or that they're dieting or something. It's just intuitive eating. And I I heard you mention this on another podcast is a space that you get to approach. um, And I think it was your guest and I can't remember which guest it was, but it was awesome. Um, Intuitive eating is a space that you get to come in and be and, and sometimes you leave and then you come back and sometimes, right. It's not this black and white thing. And even as professionals, like, I'm not a perfect intuitive eater. It's something that you have to work on. And so you can't hold that perfection expectation, right? Because then you get back into that mentality that is what surrounds dieting. And so I just, I think the gray is, you know, being an advocate and, and holding a line. But if it starts getting judgmental and people are, you know, telling other people what to do, um, and that they can't do, you know, something else or a different approach. I don't know. I just feel like it misses the the mark. Like it, it takes away from the message of what intuitive eating is. And it's guiding people to um, get back in touch with their own bodies. And yeah, you might, you might see a behavior or something that you feel like, you know, that they could change that might help them out. But it's guiding them to their own conclusion and letting them come to that without biting their head off or telling them they can't or can't do something. Beautifully said. One thing I would add as far as a practical thing that I see so much in my practice is people who, and I actually do believe that there is a time and a place for this, so I'm not dogging this, but I'm just, I'm just sort of trying to help anybody in the, in the trenches here kind of recognize that there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So I do see this sort of black and white rejection of dieting in all of its forms and um the the this is probably a very controversial thing to say but I'm going to say it anyway I'm getting brave Mo- not all diets most of them you know are based on some kernel of truth that's then taken to the extreme that becomes completely unscientific and actually not healthy for you if you follow it in its entirety but there are probably some principles of what is being recommended that might be might be a kernel of truth scientifically or even practically. So one thing I see is this kind of initial stage of working on intuitive eating where it feels like I can't eat anything that I used to eat when I was dieting or those foods are bad or if I'm noticing that I'm really wanting to order a salad, for instance, I'm feeling shame because I'm engaging in diet culture. I just like... I actually had, that was like my day on repeat yesterday was like this conversation coming up over and over again. And I totally feel for the person who is 
experiencing this. It's real. It's valid. There's nothing wrong with it. And I do think that you need to go, a lot of people need to go through a period of time where it's like, screw salads. Like, I'm not doing that. And that's totally fine. I'm not here to say, you know, only eat salads and be an intuitive eater, right? It's easy to misinterpret me on a podcast. Please try to (laughs) understand where I'm coming from here. But what I am trying to say is eventually after months, sometimes weeks or months or even years of giving yourself full permission and really trying to grapple with that idea of full permission to choose what you want to choose with your eating, you typically do start to gravitate towards, in general, like fairly well-balanced pattern of eating. And you might you might notice that like you gravitate towards a salad one day and cheesecake another. And the whole point of intuitive eating is there is no moral judgment around that all of it's okay. And what I notice a lot of people do is they're like, they're still doing the good food, bad food, except they're doing it opposite, right? They're like, okay, now I have to eat the foods that I used to define as bad. And if I ever eat a food that's good, then I am not a good intuitive eater. And it's like triple reverse psychology. It kind of makes me feel cross-eyed <laughs> when I even imagine it. But I can totally see where people are coming from. And all I'm trying to say here is there are no good and bad foods food is neutral. Therefore, you will notice that sometimes you want veggies and that doesn't that doesn't deserve like a moral judgment whether that's yay, good for me, I want veggies or oh my gosh, I'm a terrible intuitive eater because I want veggies. Like it it just is what it is. So I think that's one example of how I would sort of encourage people to explore this gray area if you're feeling like you're still really categorizing foods, but just maybe in like a reverse way, maybe taking a look at like, oh, I still need to work on food neutrality. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's so it's so true that when you know you're recovering and you're you're shifting to intuitive eating, then the labeling switches. And and for some people, it is a good idea for you to avoid certain foods until you can get that space of neutrality. Um, And those foods seem scary and you're like, wait a minute, you know, am I engaging in my eating disorder or am I engaging in dieting because I'm eating this, this, you know, so-called, you know, health food or this food that I, I used to eat when I was, you know, dieting. And it's like, no, it's okay. That's, you got to drop the labels, right? You're, you're labeling it again and it, it just needs to be neutral. You can have a salad and vegetables and quinoa or whatever trendy health foods are out there and be okay and not be dieting um a variety of foods right we need a variety of foods always so yeah and i think i you we talked about this right before we started recording leah that the other day i posted on instagram that i feel like i'm this um social media introvert like here i am like talking weekly on a podcast and you know super open and and vulnerable in so many ways to lots of um criticism maybe or and or good things but anyway but when it comes to posting something on social media I like freeze up I'm like oh am I saying this the right way or if I'm posting a picture of a salad will people think that I'm like a crazy like wolf in sheep's clothing with intuitive eating or whatever I mean there's just a lot of um there's just a lot of things to unpack. Gosh, like always, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is the cool thing about this work is whether you're a professional or a regular person listening, like doing this work of unpacking your own um, biases towards food or weight stigma issues or um, or your own body image journey, whatever it might be, or your own relationship with food journey it's like you're going to become a better person in the process because you're you're being introspective, you're working on yourself, you're learning how to like be vulnerable and be brave and like all these cool things that are so important in life. But um, and, and food often and bodies give us the opportunity to practice that, whether we're professionals or not. So that's one way I like to kind of look at this is no problem if you're feeling like gosh i've swung the pendulum over here i might i i'm giving myself a bit of permission to kind of find that middle ground that's right for me don't feel any ounce of shame if you've gone through that in fact sometimes it's a really important part of the process to be able to be like i've been on both extremes i've been on both sides i know they aren't for me here i am where i'm able to really engage with my with my food and my body in a way that's that's feeling great for me because really in the end that's what we're trying to do and there's so many opinions out there about how to do it and 
what the right way is. And I, um, I think they're all great food for thought, but like, don't take anyone's word for it. Like do it yourself and experiment with it. Yeah. When it comes down to it, you know, dietitians, you know, anybody in the health field, like we're here to help people. Like that's why we got into this because we love helping people and we want to help people feel their best. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't know. What else, what else should we add? So let's just take a minute, Leah, and kind of outline the issues with having a really black and white approach to intuitive eating um, that we see just sort of like, like we've, like I've already said, like, I think that there is a time and a place for um, a really like strident voice in the community. And I think that that's okay. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm hoping if anyone's listening who, who identifies in that way, doesn't feel like I'm mad at them for, you know, engaging in this work in a way that feels right for them. That's great. Um, really what I'm trying to kind of outline here with you, Leah, is this idea of like kind of the regular everyday average person, like what are the issues in engaging in the pursuit of intuitive eating, let's just say with a really militant all or nothing mindset. So the first one that comes to mind for me is dieting is super black and white, right? I mean, like, any diet you've ever been on has black and white rules of what you can and can't do, what's right and wrong, what you should and shouldn't. And I think that if we take that same mentality and approach it, approach um, intuitive eating with that, we're not really getting any better, you know, like we're just doing the same thing reincarnated in a new way. And so I think that in the end, it's really antithetical to the whole idea of what it means to embrace intuitive eating if you're just being really all or nothing about it. And let me just give a quick example because I like to be concrete. I really think that if we get caught up in labeling certain behaviors as good and bad, certain, well, I mean, there are certain behaviors that we know for sure are disordered, but there are some like choices. For example, if we say, if you eat this food, then you are not an intuitive eater or then you're doing it wrong. I think we're really missing the point because two two people can make the exact same choice with their food and one person could do it for extremely disordered reasons that are just grounded in, in some really problematic thoughts and behaviors and relationships with their own self and body. But then another person might make that same exact choice because for, for reasons that are totally within the realm of what we're aiming for. Like, gosh, I want to feel good. I want to have energy. I want to give my body um, fuel and nourishment. And this really is what's sounding satisfying to me. So I think when we get into the habit of being like judgy and sort of all or nothing about, in, about what our choices are or even um, a, a particular behavior, um, we kind of miss the point because to me, intentions and kind of reasons behind things are what matters and we don't always get to see that. So it's, it is a bit more work to kind of navigate that personally. Um, but I, I really think in the end, that's what we're aiming for is like choosing things for the reasons that are for the right reasons, which I always say, and I always refer to The Bachelor because they say that all the time in there, and I feel like none of my guests ever really watch The Bachelor, but I do. Anyway, what do you think about that? Okay, so some thoughts I had, I was writing I was writing down. Um, when we stay in the black or white, all or nothing mentality, we're carrying characteristics over that are involved in dieting. Perfectionism, being able to pass or fail at something, making it wrong or right. And when you're thinking like, okay, you know, this is how you intuitive eat, intuitively eat. It looks just like this and somebody else can't live up to that or can't mimic that. Then they get in this, you know, this failure mode where, you know, I can't intuitively eat. I keep trying and I can't get there. And, you know, naturally I think people, especially in the world of nutrition, they want to go to somebody and they want them to tell them exactly what to eat, exactly what it's going to look like, exactly when it's going to happen. And that's just not the reality of how it works. It's a it's a journey and a space that you're coming in and out of and people and a lot of my patients are uncomfortable with that gray spot that it doesn't look precisely like this certain way or there's not a certain date and time where I've arrived I'm I'm all of a sudden you know an intuitive eater like all 
you know, it's, it's this place that you come in and out of and it's, a, it's kind of a, uncomfortable to be in that middle area because we are so used to thinking in black and white and there is this checklist of things. And so that's kind of my... Oh, it's a beautiful way of saying that. And I love the point about you're bringing in those characteristics that, that are really the, at the core of the issue usually, such as perfectionism. That's a really good example because a lot of people that find themselves really wrapped up in the whole pursuit of like being the perfect eater through chronic dieting um, are, are also like no surprise, really driven, motivated, hardworking, incredibly like talented and also very perfectionist people. Right. So if we're, if we're being very perfectionist and like thinking, okay, how can I check off these boxes? Now I'm an intuitive eater. We're really missing the point because it's all great. It's nuanced. It's messy it's some days are just amazing and you're like gosh this is flowing other days you're like woo I still have a lot to work on and that's cool and um yeah that's I like I like that point about the perfectionism um any other thoughts about like really what what are the issues with I mean we've we've kind of spent the whole podcast talking about that but is there anything else you wanted to highlight in terms of what are the issues with approaching intuitive eating with an all or nothing mindset? I think when you're trying to share a message that you feel really passionate about or that you you really want to advocate, you know, with black and white and, you know, intuitive eating that message, if you want to spread the message of intuitive eating and get other people on board, and, and I say this, it, it is such a nuanced topic because you don't want to have to, you know, step around everybody or beat around the bush or make sure you're not offending anybody, right? Like, that's annoying. And, but if you want to get other people on board, if you're going to be constantly pointing the finger that what you're doing is wrong and that your way sucks, people are going to get defensive and they're not going to be on board. And I just don't think it's the best way to share a message that you're passionate about. You know, it's like inviting people instead of, you know, pointing the finger and, and saying, because I think this, that makes you wrong. Um, I think that's that's the problem with the, that black and white thinking is people people get really turned off by the message. Okay, that is a great point. And that makes me think about something unrelated. Like, okay, so let's say you get in a fight with your best friend because she lied to you. Let's just say that. And then you approach her and you just you're like really angry you're yelling and then the next thing you know you're actually fighting about the way that you approached her not about the topic at hand right so this is like a this is like a manipulative thing that that I deal with all the time with my kids um where it's just like now next thing you know you're, you're like in this new space where you're arguing or arguing or having a discussion about something that is totally unrelated to the initial purpose of talking. And so I think that this is sort of a lesson in bridge building, which is what we're talking about here. It's like you need to find common ground. You need to um, approach approach your friends and family who may, you know, disagree with intuitive eating or maybe aren't aware of it with what do we have in common? What are our common values? How can we how can we connect on that level? And also you don't not everybody is going to come come to your side with this. Not everybody is ready for it. Not, not everybody has gone on a million diets and is convinced that they're wrong. I mean, that's the best, that's the prime candidate for who this works for is someone who's like, okay, I know for sure that diets don't work because I've been there, done that. Mm-hmm. Um, not everybody has that experience and, and may not be able to kind of relate on that level. So... Um, yeah, just making sure that when we're discussing and exploring these topics, we're trying to do it in a way that is actually producing a conversation around the topic at hand rather than the delivery of the message or rather than the the tone of voice or the strident way in which you, um, you know, yelled at someone for saying the wrong thing, let's just say. So not that I'm perfect at this or even really have, you know, a ridiculous amount of experience that I, I feel kind of incapable of even, um, you know, teaching other people how to do this because I think that this is really tricky and there's probably so many other people who 
who have really do dove into this idea of like how do you build bridges how do you have conversations with people you disagree with i mean this is this is a huge topic but also at the same time i think that hopefully we've provided a few nuggets um, to kind of try to build that bridge with with other clinicians if you're a provider or, or um, with friends and family or acquaintances that that you come across who may see things a little bit differently and may have different experiences but um Leah, what else did you did you want to add anything to the idea of like what what's what are the issues with the black black and white all or nothing approach with intuitive eating? No, I feel I feel like we we covered most of it. I think the one thing that I think of is when you said bridging the gap between different approaches and other clinicians is you're always more productive when you're working together and I do see a lot of um kind of isolating amongst dietitians sometimes just I guess dietitians kind of have a culture and I, I would like to see us working together more and just because you subscribe to one way um, doesn't mean that you can't brush shoulders with somebody else and who has a different approach and that bridging relationships with other clinicians who have different approaches and and sharing you know your approach and just being okay with that and letting people, you know, come to their conclusions and learning from each other, like we're going to be able to help more people. And there's space for so many, you know, we work with so many different kind of clients on so many different, that have so many different nutrition needs. And um, knowing that each one of us provides our own personality and our own approach, that's going to really, you know, benefit our client. And, and that's, that's great. Yeah, that's that's a great point. So let's let's round up this conversation by talking about maybe some practical ideas for how a person might know w when they've found that sweet spot. Maybe when they're they're not in the space where they're continually overcorrecting on one end of the spectrum or not. Um, let's talk about that both in terms of like a dietitian provider type standpoint, but then also maybe just a layperson standpoint as well. How does a person know that they've reached that that point where they're like, again, not the end of intuitive eating because they're you, we're always going to be eating, we're always going to be learning and putting ourselves in new situations where we continually grow and expand in this way. But how does a person find that sweet spot where they're like, ah, okay, this is good, this this feels good to me? Do you have any ideas about that? Let's go. Let's talk about the layperson first, and then we'll talk about dietitians and providers later. Yeah, so as a layperson, I think you know you've kind of hit that sweet spot. I feel like, honestly, when you're not really thinking about it so much anymore, when you're kind of just going through your day-to-day -day and you're, you're listening to your hunger and fullness cues and you're having a variety of foods and you get to engage in social, social settings with eating and you're okay with the fact that sometimes you might overeat and sometimes you realize you didn't eat enough and that there's not like this big reaction to it. You're just like, oh, I learned something from that. And now I can, you know, remember next time I have the same schedule next week, I can plan ahead a little bit. And, you know, sometimes when, um, you know, if I feel like I overate, like I'm okay because that's, that's normal eating. Sometimes it's overeating. And um, so, yeah, for a lay person, that's kind of what I feel like is when – you don't really think about it. Or there's not so much reaction to it anymore, and especially no shame or guilt. Love it. That's great. I love those those three things. So you're not thinking about it all the time, but it occupies some time and energy in your day. Obviously, you have to consider these things, but you don't. It's not like night and day all the time. And then the idea that when you really notice, wow, I can eat. X food that used to make me feel so guilty and now I just eat it and move on with my day. I mean, that's such a great feeling. Um, I love that. And also if you're, if you're still struggling with that and still kind of in the over and under correcting type of like pendulum swing that we've been talking about, one idea is to, to take a look at maybe when you've been rejecting the dieting mentality and you're moving towards that intuitive eating space, maybe you really let go of all of the physical food restrictions you used to put on yourself. But a lot of times the, the next step 
and the next thing to work on is like what about my mental restrictions like what what rules do I still have in my head and and for some people like we've already mentioned that can be like reverse like now it's like my rule is I can't eat green things I have to only eat donuts or whatever you know for example um and kind of just make sure that that the res- the whole good food bad food restriction food morality thing is really being dealt with both on like a practical level what you're eating but then also on a mental level like what how are you talking to yourself about food how are you approaching food and sometimes that can still wreak havoc on your relationship with food even if you feel like gosh I'm not restricting anymore I don't get why I'm still feeling so chaotic around food you sometimes it, it's really worthy to kind of take a look at that mental side of things too so and that might be best explored in therapy mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes um love that so what are your ideas about you know you could you could speak personally about your own professional experience of of feeling like you've honed in on a great space for you personally and professionally um, in your approach with clients how does how does a provider know that they've reached that I mean that's a big question good luck (laughs) no that's okay um you know and I, I have gone through this I have experienced this and I'll say from you know, swinging one way to just being really kind of angry and um, just like, I hate dieting and I hate diet culture and all of that to being a little bit more peaceful about it. Um, I think it just, it looks, it looks like being, being at peace with your approach, being at peace with your message and understanding and empathizing that we all grew up in the same diet culture. We've all been exposed to very similar nutrition information and that that's, that's nobody's like fault, I guess you could say. Right. And so it's like, I have learned this, this new approach and I can advocate it and I can feel really confident in the message that I have and I can understand and kind of like, empathize with other people because we grew up in the same world that they might not understand that or they might not be there or have been exposed to it and that's okay I'm not going to let that upset me or pigeonhole them into you know whatever whatever they're currently doing that there's things that I can learn from them and there's things that they can learn from me and that is the most ideal situation is when we can take things from each other and kind of create this this teamwork. Love that. And one of the kind of mantras that I try to live by with, you know, occupying like a semi-activist in a semi-activist space. I mean, I don't know if I really identify in that way. But anyway, I have a podcast where I talk about social justice issues on a regular basis. So I guess I'm a part of that world. One of the things that I like to kind of keep in mind is I'm really trying – um, my best to, to figure out how to be very tough on systems and really like have some hard lines with with the systemic problems that I see in our in our culture, one of them being, you know, di- our, our dieting culture. But then be really soft on the individual people that that come that you come into contact with. And to me, that's the difference that I was talking about earlier, where I'm I'm kind of like, I feel like I need to there. It's different when you're talking to a large group of people or podcasting with, you know, thousands of listeners, tens of thousands of listeners. Like I have to, I have to be tough on systems, but soft on, on individual people. It's tough to be soft on individual people when you're talking to that many at once. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's, that's a mantra I try to live by. Um, and, and also keep in mind, like when you're engaging, in these discussions, you know, especially online, it can feel like, oh, I'm I'm attacking the system, but then you're talking to like an individual person who's behind the who's behind the computer and like with feelings, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I I mean, I don't know about you, Leah, but I'm like sensitive, and I'm like, I don't. This isn't really in my nature to like be really public and like do this because it's super hard. I get a lot of, you know. Anyway, it's it's hard. Um, <laughs> But I, I try to sort of remember that for myself. Like this, I, I'm ideas are fair game to attack and to explore and to discuss and to question. People aren't, you know, like we don't want to attack people. We don't want to 
we want to be able to build the bridge with the person and then explore ideas together. And separating that for yourself is, I think, a really good first step. So I'm blabbering on, but that's that's sort of what I would say in terms of like how a professional knows or, or can kind of start to unpack or continue to unpack all of this is sort of like being very open that maybe some ideas you have are wrong and not not totally um, identifying, over identifying with that as a crucial part of who you are as a person. And then also when we are exploring issues, really recognizing and and distinguishing the difference between a system versus an individual. I love that, a system versus individual, because we are trying to be proponents of change. Like we want to change things in the school districts and the way health is taught, health class. And you know, we want to spread the message of health at every size and get doctors on board when their patients come to them and they don't just send them away telling them they need to lose weight or something. Um, so we are, you know, really trying to drive this change and change our diet culture. But you're right, like we're working with humans and people who have feelings and you have to take that into consideration. So I really, really like that. Good. Yeah, I think um, I think this is such a tricky topic, and I'm just hoping everybody listening understands the spirit of what we're trying to do here. And you know, I think I think that the, I'm all about like giving permission to people to be able to like live their authentic life. And if in any way this conversation has come off as us saying this is the way to do it, you know, like you need to be compassionate and you need to be right in the middle and you need to live in the gray, like definitely, again, like antithetical to what we're saying, like we're not trying to be prescriptive here. We're just trying to sort of paint a picture of what it might look like for someone who's like, okay, I've rejected dieting and I'm in this new space and it's just not feeling right. If that's you, you want to look at some of these things we've talked about. And also you have full permission to explore it different and and to land in a different place than the way that you and I Leah have talked about today and I'm sure in a lot of ways Leah and I have landed in different places and that's cool too and look we can still like sit in the same room together and talk about really important and what I think is interesting topics so um I think we need a little more of this in our world that's the only thing I'll say politically is like maybe just trying to kind of work on our own ability to like build bridges with people, I mean, this comes up a lot during the holiday season too, where it's like you're going to be around Aunt Sally, who's like crazy political, whatever, or this other person who I disagree with on these important levels, and and somehow every single year we seem to come together and like make it work, and it's and you're never mad you did, you know, and it's like it's you realize what's important in life is is not a person's ideas, it's it's like who they are, and I think we can practice that with this whole realm of intuitive eating, but it becomes really important in other areas too, because we're all human beings with lots of different people in our lives who we disagree with, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, I think we've said everything pretty, okay. pretty much. I don't know. All right, Leah, take a minute to talk about you and what you do um, in Salt Lake and how people can keep in touch with you. Yeah. Just take a few minutes to talk about that. Awesome. Um, so I have a private practice uh, and I have an Instagram. And those are the two things I have going right now. Um, so you can find my Instagram. It's called Body Meets Food. Uh, I'm kind of new to this uh, this area and getting myself out there. So uh, my email, if you want to email me, is Leah, L-E-A-H, at bodymeetsfood.com. And that's M-E-E-T-S. Um and I help people repair their relationship with food, create um, peaceful eating habits. I work with eating disorders, chronic dieting, um, anybody who's just curious and in intuitive eating in this kind of approach, health at every size. Um, you know, my, my main mission is to, to help people become the expert of their own body again and to get away from all the noise that it's out that is out there and really guide them into a peaceful, loving space for themselves. So yeah, you can follow my Instagram or send me an email. And maybe when this is released in December, I'll have a blog up by then. So, Okay. So would it be bodymeetsfood.com then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If the website's up, yeah, that's what it would be. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Leah, for 
you know, reaching out to me and being willing to tackle such a tricky topic with me. I know that this has potential to ruffle some feathers and it's never the intention, but that sometimes is the result. But I, but if anything, I'm just hoping this gets everybody, regardless of who you are and where you come from, sort of uh, some food for thought, like I always say, but also, you know, just some ideas of, of how to explore and how to maybe navigate the tricky, tricky space we're in where we're really trying to advocate for change and social justice, but also trying to hold space for that person who doesn't really see things that way sometimes. So hopefully we did the topic justice. I know we could probably go on and on and on forever, but thank you so, so much for being here. And I've, I've really loved talking to you today, Leah. Thanks so much, Paige, for having me. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoyed. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening and we'll see you soon for another episode.